RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. It's Friday morning on Reality Check Radio, and we're going to try something new here at RCR. We're going to launch a political panel, and we're going to do it, hopefully, every Friday morning. And we've got three people planned for this. I won't talk about the third because uh, we're waiting on the third. Anyway, I want to introduce Cameron Slater. I probably don't need to introduce you, Cameron, actually. No, I, my, my infamy precedes me. Yeah. Yeah, sitting there with all those cigars sitting in those drawers behind you, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, and all and, and all my cookeries and you know military and you know, I'm a gun nut and a conspiracy theorist and all the other things the ma- mainstream media tells lies about. Well, maybe we shouldn't be talking to you. We didn't do well, our due diligence. I, I didn't think you guys were um, into no, um, that sort of thing. I thought you were into everything, hearing every. Uh, we are. Type of opinion. I'm glad you've been listening to the marketing. <laughs> yeah. It does get in. And Olivia Pearson, blogger, author. Is this true? Olivia, I've done a, hardly any research. Western values defended. <laughs> yes, I, I defend it's those you. quite tenaciously. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe you'll have to defend them here. I'll be happy to. Okay. I'm sure there'll be something in this list that will require you to say something about that in that direction. Excellent. Okay, so we, we're here to talk about local, well, when I say local politics, the politics of New Zealand. And uh, Cameron, you've kind of shaped the list of topics here. Where do you want to start? Where do we start in this? Well, I think we should start with the polls because there's been three polls out within the last week or so. We had the Roy Morgan poll. Uh, which showed Labour and National, um, you know, sitting at around about 30, 32%. Um, Labour slipping a little bit there. Greens going up a bit, act sliding. Um, but it really looks like a situation where the Maori Party or New Zealand First could hold the balance of power. And then we've got a choice then between a hard left uh, racially divisive type government with the Labour Party, the Green Party and the Maori Party or a centre-right um, with New Zealand First uh, anointing national and act. And uh, then we had the Taxpayers Union Courier poll which came out this week which again showed um, uh, Labour on the slide but no growth in the National Party. We're not seeing any growth in in Nationals um, numbers in these polls. And then, of course, um, the latest poll came out uh, yesterday, and that is the Talbot Mills, who, of course, are the pollsters for the Labour Party. And uh, that shows a, a similar pattern where Labour's falling, uh, but National is still um, sort of mired on that uh, percentage around the 30, 32% that doesn't, isn't growing. And uh, all of these polls, are, in my mind, are pointing to the fact that uh, the voters or the electors are not uh, warming to Christopher Luxon. His net favourables are negative. And it's very hard to win government when your leader has a negative uh, net favourable. So for listeners, if they don't know what uh, net favourables are, net favourables, uh, they take all the people who said that they've got a, a favourable uh, opinion of you, and then you take away the people who have an unfavourable uh, opinion of you. And if you're a decent politician, who's worth worth their salt, then you'll have a positive number. And if you're in the negative, then basically your unfavorables outweigh your favorables. And that's where Luxon is. He's in the in the negatives. He was a month ago he was negative one. In the latest courier poll he's negative seven. So he's going down. The more people get to see Christopher Luxon, the worse it gets for him. I said we'd have a third member joining this panel and he's now coming into the program. I'd like to welcome Chris Trotter. Chris, welcome to Reality Check Radio. Thanks for joining the panel. It's a pleasure. Okay, so we've just been doing a bit of early chat about the polls, and I think you're aware of where they're at. And I think, Cameron, you're making the choice that, or sorry, the uh, comment that Christopher Luxon has just, he stalled out, right? He's stalled out. He's going down in the the net favourables, and it's now affecting 
the ability of National to grow their vote. They are stagnant. And the, these three polls, they either went down slightly, you know, within the margin of error, or didn't grow at all with no change. And you can attribute that directly to the leader. Because, uh, you know, if a leader is very popular and you get the, the Jacinda Ardern situation where she came in um, at the last minute replacing Andrew Little and all of a sudden it lifted Labour up um, because she had, had very positive net favourables. You know, the, the last leader that had negative um, favourables but managed to win an election was Jim Bolger. Right. Um, and that was because people were just heartily, and Chris could probably expand on this a little bit more, being um, involved deeply in the left wing on that at that particular era. Um, but uh, Jim, they, he, Jim Bolger's government was elected bec- mainly because people were heartily sick of the Labour Party at that stage. Chris? Yes, well, that's true. There's no doubting that um, Rogernomics had made... Labour unelectable, uh, and so Jim Bolger was the man who who stepped in as Prime Minister. Um, three years later, however, um, as as Cam rightly says, uh, his party was very unpopular also, but we were under first-past-the-post still in 1993, and even though National barely got a third of the vote, um, the rest of the... Uh, of the country divided its uh, its votes among Labour, the Alliance, New Zealand First, uh, and so uh, National squeaked back in. But uh, yeah, that would uh, that would not be the case now. It's a very very different system, and uh, Luxon has just surprised me in terms of. His inability to to make that connection with the electorate. I mean, on paper, um, he should be a, a reasonably popular national leader. I mean, he he ticks the boxes, um, but uh, he just doesn't tickle the fancy of the voters, unfortunately. Olivia, I need I'm... to ask you because they say I've heard that he, he or that party has to appeal to the female vote. Christopher Luxon does not appeal to females as far as I can tell. Mm. Um, absolutely not. There's, um, there's some, he's too spineless. I mean, I don't know when men are going to get this through their head, but women actually admire strong men in leadership. Um, and that is a worldwide phenomenon. And Christopher Luxon has been so spineless on absolutely everything that I'm not surprised that women are just yawning every time his face is on or he's his voice is on he's he's um he's he's basically got no nuts <laughs> well the other thing with um Christopher uh, Luxon and people mock me for this is that he's bald now you might think that's rather superficial but <laughs> name name me a bald leader anywhere in the world that succeeded. Uh, and and there's, I, I only say there's one exclusion to this, and that is uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, but he won two wars before yeah. he became president. He had something else going. Yeah, yeah not exactly, exactly a spineless man. <laughs> he had those uh, yeah. kahunas. Um, well, I'm not sure that this, that this will help National at all, but uh, there is another uh, world leader um, who was bald as a badger, and that was Benito Mussolini. But as I say, I'm not sure that will help National. Well, he was a dictator, and then there was Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev as well, of course. But yeah, again, no, that's, true. Dic- that's true. Another dictator, that's true. but dictators can be bald, but um, democratically elected yeah. bald men don't exist. I remember watching an interview ages ago, uh, back in the day. Chris, you probably remember this. It was a debate between. I think Bill Rowling and Robert Muldoon on TV. <laughs> and I think uh, Rob actually barefaced right in front of Bill Rowling questioned the sound of his voice. He did. <laughs> and the reason I mention that is because now, you know, you've got the voice you're born with or whatever, but it seems to me, and I know a bit about voices, that Christopher Luxon lacks a powerful voice. Mm, he, another, he can't, he, right. he can't, deliver that soaring sort of sound, that lifting he, rhetoric, because it's all sort of like this, you know. Oh, is there something in that? Is there something in that, do you think? 
yes, I do think I think you're absolutely bang on with that again because it doesn't it doesn't um, bespeak strength, does it? It, it, it it's another um, tell Weakness. another tell on spinelessness. Well, certainly, um, Bill Rowling, um, you know, was not blessed um, with the attributes um, of your political hero. I mean, he was a mild-mannered sort of man. Um, Churchill might say was a lot to be mild-mannered about, but um, no, he had the he had the high-pitched voice, and of course. Um, Sir Robert Jones, uh, or Bob Jones as he was then, uh, just pilloried him all the time, calling him the mouse, and even walking through a TV studio in a mouse costume when the Prime Minister was being interviewed. (laughs) Ah, those were the days. Well, Muldoon, I think the quip that Muldoon said was that he had heard that the Labour caucus was going to dig a pit um, for Bill Rowling to campaign from in an attempt to lower his voice. <laughs> oh, well, that wasn't the worst of, of Rob's insults. Uh, the, the, the one that I remember most vividly uh, was uh, when he said that he'd seen the shivers all over Bill Rowling's body looking for a spine to crawl up. <laughs> <laughs> a great line, by the way. It is a good line. <laughs> yes, well, oh, he was he was the dab hand at the political insult. The most famous, of course, is he said that people uh, who who emigrated to Australia uh, lifted the in- intelligence quotient of both countries. <laughs> <laughs> so, could they change him out? Like you've mentioned, the Jacinda move. Now would be the time, wouldn't it? Well, well to who? To, to what? I mean, people yeah. say to me, "Oh, Erica Stanford." Well. What's she ever done apart from fill Murray McCulley's boots? Nothing. Um, you know, do, do we get Nicola Willis? I mean, honestly, if we think that uh, uh, Christopher Luxon is weak and woke, um, what we'd end up with, with is someone like her who's weak and woke and sounds like a scold. And, you know, I don't think voters would go for that. Um, you know, she's just so shrill. Yeah, well, in, I think, Ken, I mean, this explains uh, ACT's success because National really has, you know, run through its face cards, it seems to me, um, and uh, it's, it's not got a lot left to play with. Uh, and so if you're on the right, um, then, you know, you have got this other party, which seemingly alone of all the parties in Parliament now, has maintained a Prussian-like discipline um, over the past, uh, you know, three years or more, um, and hasn't really uh, put, a f- put a foot wrong. So... Um, we don't know, have a right wing, Chris. Is, the, prob- <laughs> the problem is that uh, you're only eating, um, you know, your own vote in a sense. If you look at the, the centre-right um, in the same way that people think of Labour and Green as the centre-left, yeah, ACT can go up, but almost always at the expense um, of, of the National Party and vice versa. Yeah, they don't grow the pie. But Olivia made a point there that we don't have a right in New Zealand because National's not a right-wing party. We don't have anything like a centre-right, and that certainly isn't coming from ACT. Um, ACT have acted like um, all the way through just, you know, well, through especially the February protest. I mean, Seymour was Jacinda's other lapdog, and it it made really clear we do not have a right wing in New Zealand. But, I mean, I've known that for a long time. It just sort of came out around the time of that protest. We really didn't have any opposition. What centre-right are you talking about, Chris? Do you really mean act? Ah, well, it it all depends where you stand, Olivia. (laughs) That's the (laughs) only thing. I'm standing national and act, uh, you know, fill the description of the centre-right quite adequately. Oh, dear. Oh dear! But that's because you're so far left. That, that, that's. Um, I was going to say I'm, I'm going to have to use the term Mr. Chotisky there, Mr. Chotisky. Uh, oh so no, no, he... no! Don't don't worry about the ER. My old mates um, yeah, on on the left just used to call me Trotsky. 
Right. <laughs> there's, there's nothing they no, can do. There's no, 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 no beating about the socialist pushes there. So there's nothing, no, there's no move that can be pulled to get them out of this. this, this I don't think there is. Well, I mean, well, I, mean I, I think that I think the obvious move is to do a deal with New Zealand first uh, and bring in Winston. And I say this because I think, unlike ACT, um, Winston will attract. Uh, supporters who otherwise in normal circumstances uh, would vote Labour because, you know, Winston's always had um, a kind of leftish support base and a rightish uh, support base. Um, and I, I just get the impression that there are people who have voted Labour or voted Green um, every time ever since MMP came along, um, or even before then. But they look at Labour now, they look at the Greens, uh, and they go, oh, I just can't see myself voting for them, not, not, not with the policies uh, and the attitudes that, that they're showing uh, to the country. Uh, and they won't vote national because that's just a tribal thing. And they won't vote ACT because, well, from their perspective, Olivia, you know, ACT is very right wing indeed. But, but Winston, Winston, they might vote for. And that would grow the pie for the centre right because it would take a crucial few percentage points away from the Labour Party and, and that in this very, very tight situation between the two blocks. That's, that's all that National needs. Well, the other thing that um, Winston would be able to attract is that around 8 to 10% of voters who previously voted National and then in 2020, because Jacinda saved us, uh, decided to vote Labour. And they're looking at the National Party and they're saying, well, you know, they're just like um, Labour, just less shit. Um, so, but we don't really want to vote for them. So they could they could easily say, well, we're going to vote for Winston because, well, I think we need a rascal and a scallywag in there that's going to act as a handbrake against these big parties that seem to do whatever they want to us. Um, you know, this whole uh, thought that we keep lurching between the red team and the blue team needs to stop because we're just encouraging them to be like each other and we don't actually get any meaningful changes to society. And by God, we, we, we have, we've got some serious problems in society now and continuing on similar policies is not going to solve those. And so we need somebody who's actually prepared to grasp the nettle and say the things that need to be said. And I think only Winston Peters can do that. Well, yeah, certainly um, Winston uh, would be able to play that handbrake metaphor for all that uh, that he's worth because, you know, there are people who look at the Greens and Te Pāti Māori and just kind of blanch in horror. And then from the other side of the political divide, there are people that look at National Act and blanch in horror um, and so, you know, once again, that that middle ground that the New Zealand First Party has always sought to capture, um, that idea of there being a force in Parliament that could, uh, you know, uh, halt the more crazy stuff. Um, I think I think there's 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 a lot of uh, there's a lot of of mileage for him to make in that regard. I had David Seymour on this program on uh, Wednesday morning, and uh, I'm bringing this up because uh, we kind of touched on this because I saw that it was possible, and after hearing you guys talk, I think it's still possible, that um, it might need New Zealand First, ACT, and National to get that block over the line. And I asked him about that, and he was very disparaging of Winston Peters. He called him a strange little man and and basically you know, dumped on him and indicated, I think, Cameron, you picked up on that, no deal, no deal. Is that a very smart move at this stage? Well, I, I, I wrote about that uh, on Thursday and said it, I thought it was stupid to have that, that attitude that 
uh, David Seymour was attacking, and, and, it, and he's been attacking National consistently um, over the last few months, and now he's attacking New Zealand first. Um, but he's going to have to work with these people whether he likes it or not. And uh, it's, it's a very strange tactic, but it's kind of a tactic that Chris alluded to earlier that he kind of has to because the ACT Party is not going to attract any voters from the Labour or the Greens or, or the Maori Party. Um, so all he can do to grow his vote and his vote alone is to attack his potential coalition partners Got it. And and attract them and and make their vote smaller so he becomes more powerful, but it doesn't grow the pie beyond the 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 lock that we've got on on the polls at the moment where it could go either way and and he's not going to be able to do that, but he kind of has to do what he's doing because it's the only way he can grow his vote, but it doesn't grow the pie. And and so it's ridiculous for him to attack um, Winston Peters because eventually they're going to have to sit down and cut a deal. And he'll say, hey, you call me a strange little man. <laughs> now, I've actually spoken to Winston about that. Um, I had a chat with him yesterday and I said, oh, what did you think about what David Seymour said? And he says, well, I don't know what David Seymour's playing at. I know who the enemy is. And the enemy is the Labour Party and the Green Party and the Maori Party. They're the enemies of New Zealand, and they want to send us down a divisive path that will end badly for everybody, and that's what my focus is. And I said to him, well, you need to say that publicly, Winston, because that's exactly what people want to hear. Olivia, is yeah. that what they want to yeah. hear? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I still can't get over the fact of the, the irony of David Seymour calling anybody else a a strange little man. Um, I mean, that he yeah, has... thought crossed my mind, Olivia. <laughs> I, I, you know, the guy has such an immense lack of self-awareness, but um, most politicians do seem to have this lack of self-awareness now, which is painful. Um, they don't actually realise um, the impact they have on people. I mean, like, like Christopher Luxon, as we were talking about before, but David has no self-awareness. But as for... Um, I mean, the people that I know who have changed their votes to ACT, which, of course, I always try and talk them out of now, um, are, are long-standing, lifelong-standing uh, National Party voters um, who realise that National sits on the centre-left now, not the centre-right, not even moderately in the middle, you, you know, not even on the right wing, but centre-left. Um, I, I think that's where nationals sit. Um, but those people are saying for the first time they will vote Seymour, um, will act. Um, but I think that's a, you know, I mean, it's everybody's right to vote, vote for who they want, of course, but um, Seymour's a mistake because um, I just think um, he speaks out of both sides of his mouth, as Winston Peters always did. I see Seymour and Peters as uh, very similar beasts, actually. I don't think there's a huge difference between them. One's more likable. I mean, Winston actually is likable. Um, Seymour is not. Um, he pisses people off left, right and centre from a, for just being chronically arrogant. Um, that interview with you, Paul, the other day is a excellent example of that. I mean, the, the cocky arrogance all the way through that was um, palpable. And I think, and I'm glad that a lot of people wrote into you and said that after hearing that interview, they would never vote Seymour. Well, that, I noticed that. Um, I think quite a few of our listeners, given the space we're in, see that as an option. But um, I would say probably a, at least a third or maybe more of the text and emails that came in stated that Mm, yeah, it was he, he made himself extremely unlikable, but he always does. He's done that very, very, he often does that at um, public meetings as well, where people go along who actually like him um, and, and throw a question at him and they get a very cocky, condescending, slightly nasty response. And that's vintage Seymour. Well, that's exactly what happened at, at our staff party a couple of years back after the 2020 election. He was surrounded by about 20 people who um, would probably have voted for him at the 2020 election. And he was asked a couple of questions. And one question was, 
where do you see ACT growing? And he said, well, I think ACT's a 10% party and no more than that. And so we're at where we are and I'm happy with that, which kind of left everybody gobsmacked. And then the second one was he was asked about what he was going to do for firearms owners, licensed firearm owners, and he said, I'm not going to do anything for them. I've got their vote. I've got them forever. They've abandoned New Zealand first, so I'm not going to do anything for them because where else are they going to go? And that arrogance <laughs> that he just displayed when he said that, mm. uh, I just couldn't believe. And it was in front of 20 other people. And, you know, and now he's come out this week or last week attacking New Zealand first over firearms. And I thought, did you forget what you said to me? Well, well maybe I should remind you of that, David, because I don't see you as doing anything for people like me as a licensed firearms owner. In fact, I think you're going to do absolutely nothing for us. And I'd rather hear an apology from Winston Peters and New Zealand first and then attempt to fix what has been broken than listen to an arrogant little man who thinks that he's got those votes forever. An arrogant, strange little man. (laughs) It's our political panel here at RCR. We've got Cameron Slater, Chris Trotter and Olivia Pearson. I think he did mention firearms really briefly in that interview, but I don't know what he was saying about it, whether he would. My impression was that he'd supported something. But, but David Seymour's got a position on everything until he doesn't. Exactly. And, and then he changes it. And, you know, he was, he was um, Jacinda's little cheerleader. Everything that she proposed, he didn't oppose it. He supported it and just criticised that they weren't going harder, faster or more efficiently as they took away our rights and our freedoms. Well, mm. I'm sorry, you can't be a classical liberal and stand there and advocate for buses to go around jabbing people on the street, um, forcing beneficiaries to um, fill in census forms if they uh, otherwise they lose their benefit, or p- penalising people um, who object to the powers of the state being extended. But there he was as a little cheerleader, and he showed his true mettle when when the uh, protest was at Parliament. And he was hiding behind Jacinda's skirts. H- hangman nooses. There were nooses. He, oh, he kept what going on. He kept, he kept going on about the nooses, didn't he? I mean, all our lives, there's been a, an idiom where, you know, people get together in a pub and they'll go, ah, politicians should be hung from the nearest lamppost. That is a, a very uh, acceptable um, sentiment that gets expressed. Nobody goes out and hangs politicians anymore, unfortunately. Um, and and Seymour has got this. He was. Uh, you pointed it out, Paul. It sounds as though you were sitting in Parliament feeling quite scared. Yeah, he didn't like that. He um, didn't like that. Um, yeah. But that, but that's he came across like a total pussy, um, cringing away in Parliament, scared that people had nooses. For God's sake. Um, and anyway, sorry, I'm nurses sorry. or nooses? Sorry, nooses. All right. <laughs> Is my English that bad? Um, they but, had they had nurses. They had nurses, um, but, but he'd be scared of a nurse, I'm sure. But as for nurses, it was such a ridiculous thing for them to keep going on about, especially considering, you know, the left and the Greens, you know, having guillotines and pretending to behead John Key on Parliament grounds. Remember that? Yeah. Um, do, and, yeah. And, and when you trample over people's rights, when you make the Bill of Rights worth nothing, when you cut freedom of speech away and everybody's censored, um, you should have angry people with p- pitchforks on your parliament lawns. You should have. Morally, you're doing something. Um, those people were doing something right and expressing that kind of outrage, and I was proud of them. But there was Seymour cringing away, quivering in his boots, and it's just pathetic. It really well, they all were, to be fair. They, they all um, were, to be fair. No? On that pitchforks thing, we, we were told by the media, by the police, that there was pitchforks, there was all these weapons. Now, when the police went and bashed everybody and cleared the place out, where was the display of these offensive weapons that they told everybody that were there? Mm. Have you seen any photos of anybody with a pitchfork? There was literally thousands of cameras there. Uh, The media were there. The police were taking photos. Where's the photos of these pitchforks and all of these offensive weapons? They just simply don't exist. It was made up. It was a, 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 a... an attempt by the state to put people in their place who they'd already put in their place 
and beggared them by mandating them out of jobs and costing them their livelihoods and their houses and their families and everything else. Why, why, why were we surprised that after 23 days or however many days it was that when the police showed up to, to dish out violence that they were met with violence in return? You know? they, were met, they were met by viol- they they weren't met by violence. They were met met by people trying to protect their computers, their tents, their gear. Yeah, you know the whole. Um, that's they, they weren't met by violence. There were some weirdos, anti for like thugs, bought in at the last moment. That was so obvious, by the way. Why doesn't anyone get that or even ask the question? I feel like I feel like sharing with you two, Cam and Olivia, the the uh, the wisdom of the old trade unionists who had lived through the 51 uh, waterfront lockout. And they would say to the youngsters who talked about uh, standing up to the bosses and standing up to the government, uh, they would just look at us and shake their heads sadly and say, listen, son, you can't take on the state and win. (laughs) And they were right. (laughs) They just grind you down. They Sorry. can always escalate up. This is the thing um, that did. I've been aware of, you know, uh, for a long, long time. If you go to to a protest with with a stick, they'll come back with a bat. And if you go to um, a, a, a protest um, with a piece of iron, they'll come back um, with uh, tear gas and rubber bullets. If if you go to uh, a protest with a gun, they'll come back with an armoured car and a 50 calibre machine gun. I mean, the state can always ratchet up the level of force at its disposal. And uh, they do. And, um, yeah, well, and, got and, that. We we yeah. got that. Um, and um, but but this is why we need our Bill of Rights to have stood for us, let alone having a politician to actually um, act as if it was inviolate. But but that did not happen. And um, and even then, when I I actually think violence would have actually been a a proportionate response. But but um, but that protest was um, peaceful and there were people running around, Chantal Baker, her father, everybody else, all the Maoris that were there, they were making sure everybody was peaceful. They were almost um, dogmatic and religious about it. So the fact that they could still call that a violent protest really annoys me because it is just so far from the truth of what happened. I got a question for all three because we're going to move on, obviously, and that is, okay, we're talking about Luxon. And, you know, should they change them out? Based on what I saw, the response yesterday into our inboxes and texting machine, maybe it's time to consider swapping David out for someone else because there's some talent in there, isn't there? In a- but is there? Well, I don't know. Is I'm there? asking. You mean Brooke Van Velden? Well, that was the name I was thinking of. She certainly speaks better than David does. You know, like she can actually hold a line of thought. But um, okay, I don't see well, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, mean, I, don't, no. I, don't, I don't know because, you, you know, they announced that they were going to stand uh, Brooke in, in uh, Tamaki Electric on the basis that apparently uh, Simon O'Connor doesn't share their values. Now, I thought that was incredibly strange to say that because and, and making the whole argument about abortion and you know i suppose it's it's relevant though for david seymour who wanted to kill grannies and now seems to be okay with killing babies but um to make a a challenge against an mp on the basis that that mp doesn't share their values whatever those are is suggesting that we have to have this homogenized view of of what society is, and we can only select the MPs with those views, and everybody else should be discarded. And I just find that anathema to democracy and the belief of free speech and uh, challenging ideas, um, you know, having a contest of ideas. I mean, you know, Chris Trotter well, and I, I, I don't, don't you, share you a lot know, of things I think, together. I think, but, what's, I think what lies behind that, uh, that move by Brooke Van Velden and, and ACT is based on um, their analysis of the polls. Um, the right 
um, has won over um, a majority of men, but women are still holding out um, from a sort of general shift. And the way there was a general shift to John Key, I mean, Labor knew it was all over um, when um, the the people I called, you know, Waitakere man and Waitakere woman made the, made the decision um, in their gut that Key was okay, they could vote for him with a clear yeah. conference, uh, conscience. Now, I think there's an element of that thinking uh, in the move uh, against uh, O'Connor in, in Tamaki. Act is trying to say uh, to women who, you know, gave a vote of thanks to Jacinda in 2020, but certainly aren't very happy with Labour now, look, come and vote for us. We're a libertarian party. We're not going to uh, interfere with a, a woman's right uh, to choose. Um, and so that, that in the end, is, is, is Act's sole strategic priority, it seems to me, to get as much of that centre-right vote as they can because they quite rightly deduce that the more they get, the bigger share of that centre-right vote that they get, the more they're going to be able to get of their agenda enacted. So for them, there really is only one goal, and that is don't sit at 10%, get 15%, and if you can get 20%, go for that as well. Do whatever it takes to eat as much of Nationals' vote as you possibly can. Because then, if you win, um, you're sitting there with roughly half the votes on the right-hand side, and you're saying to um, Christopher Luxon, um, if you think you can just pat us on the head and, and send us away and, and you'll do all the, the heavy policy lifting, well, think again, because we've got an agenda and we've got the share of the vote to make that agenda um, a viable proposition. So I, I, th I think that's what's behind moves like uh, like Brooke Van Velden and, uh, and, and to Tamaki. And I think that's... What's driving act? There's, they can't, they can't make themselves. Well, they can't, as as Cam says, they can't grow the pie, but they can sure as heck grow their share of it. Do you, Chris? Do you mean um, what you you said that that that's them trying to scoop up the centre right vote? Did you mean to say the left, or did you mean to say the centre right? <laughs> uh, if I misspoke, I'm sorry. But no, what I'm talking about is is uh, the national vote and the ACT vote. At the moment, national has a preponderance of um, conservative voters in its corner. Now, what ACT, obviously, what ACT wants to do is pull as many voters out of the National Party corral and, and uh, allow them in, into ACT's corral. Because when the votes have all been cast and counted, and if the right has emerged victorious, well, then the more um, seats they have, the bigger share of the party vote that they are able to win, um, the more influence they're going to have about uh, policy going forward. What about Andrew Hoggard going to act? Andrew who? Oh, I think, yeah, I think uh, he follows in the fine tradition of Owen Jennings, doesn't he? Uh, he was another federated farmers man who joined act way back in the 90s. Um, there's always been uh, an element out there in rural New Zealand um, that has been willing to vote for ACT, and it waxes and wanes, but uh, if they look at national out there in the provinces and in rural New Zealand and they don't like what they see, well, ACT is always there. And, and Hoggard, like Jennings, I think, uh, prefers the clearer views um, that you can hear coming from ACT uh, to the rather muddled uh, messages coming from Christopher Luxon. I think um, Andrew Ho Hoggard has fallen into the trap that a lot of these people who have got positions elsewhere um, and largely talk to the converted or their members, um, they mistake that um, that support or they perceive it as support as translating into votes. It's a little bit like all the Greens and 
everybody's saying, well, we've got 400,000 likes on Facebook. And then you point out to them their vote and you say, well, if, if everyone who said they liked you on Facebook voted for you, you'd have a lot more MPs, but they just don't. And, and this mm. is the problem that you've got um, with people like Andrew Hoggard and then you've got these other p- people in these smaller parties that are out there saying, well, we've got a real chance of winning this seat and winning that seat and all of those sort of things. The polls aren't showing that. And they'll say, oh, well, the polls are crooked. And it's, well, okay, you could put your head in the sand if you like. But the last political party that entered parliament without a sitting MP to piggyback them in was the ACT Party in 1996. And since then, if you don't have a sitting MP in your party, you don't get elected. And so people like Matt King, who are out there trying really hard, and he's doing an admiral, admiral, a good job. Um, The thing is, is that he's just not going to get there. He's not going to win Northland. Uh, and he's not going to get the 150,000 votes or so that are required to get 5%. And so mm-hmm. it's a, just a waste of time. And what people in those small minor parties should really do is pick either New Zealand First or ACT and support them. And that's the way that yep. they'll affect yep. change. Well, I, I, I have to say that um, that's what uh, that's what, um, I think it was the Maxim Institute and a number of others. That's what they impressed upon um, uh, right-wing voters, particularly uh, Christian right-wing voters. Uh, back in 2005, I think it was, it was, you know, this splintering the vote um, is nuts. If you want to get rid of Labour, and that should be what you want to do, then you have to vote for the National Party. And they were very successful in that. Um, Don Brash came within a whisker of of winning that election. In fact, I've always said if the vote had been on the Wednesday and not the Saturday, National would have won in 2005, and that would have made for a very interesting uh, three years, it seems to me. Um, That's because they had um, John Ansell as their admin. Sorry? They had John Ansell as their admin, did they not? Oh, oh, yes, the the advertising campaign by uh, um, Kiwi Kiwi, right? Was one of of the best I've seen. In fact, I haven't seen a better one um, since 1975, to be honest. Oh, God. Okay, moving on. Okay, no, one one last comment. I've just got to be mindful of the time, you know. Yeah. It's my job. That's right, we move on. Okay, so let's bundle these two together, maybe. The Walker jump and um, the other one who left the Greens. So Mecca jumping the Walker, there's, there's a new term, and Elizabeth um, leaving. Kerry, Kerry. Yeah, Kerry, Kerry, leaving. So it's what coincidental that this sort of happened within Kui of each other, these things happen. Yeah, I think there's well, slightly different stories going on there. Um, I think there's... There's an element um, of the history of, of Matt Rata and what uh, Mika Fatiri has done. You know, I think people in the, in the Pākehā world, they, they struggle to understand the, 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 the sensitivities um, of, of Māori sometimes. I mean, Matt Rata, he left um, the Labour Party when he was passed over um, by Bill Rowling, of all people. Um, and I think that same sense of, of um, being slighted was, was very much present in the mind of, of Mika Faitiri uh, when she um, went back home and consulted her gut and, <laughs> and said goodbye to... Um, the Labour Party and hello uh, to to Party Maori. So I think there's there's a sort of a story and a sort of a uh, a political historical background to that sort of move, which you know is is may not be laudable, but it's at least understandable. I think in the case of Elizabeth Kerry Kerry, that is just the the result of fratricidal strife just internal warfare, um, which she lost 
Um, she was on the losing side and she decided that the game was no longer um, worth the candle. Um, and knowing also, I suspect shrewdly, that the Greens had voted against the Electoral Integrity Act and so they weren't going to invoke it against her. So she could go on drawing her salary for another um, four or five months um, and uh, then leave. So that's that's where we are with the Greens. I mean, it's not a good look for the centre-left. I mean, it, 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 it does speak of instability of internal ructions of, of outright um, strife um, and and deep-seated animosities, particularly in the case of the Greens. And this is not a good look going into an election, not a good look at all. Yeah, I tend to agree with, with you on that, Chris, in that uh, it's not a good look for the left. It looks shabby. It looks tawdry. It looks convenient. Yeah. Um, we are, we pass laws that are supposed to prevent these things. And then when this happens, what we see is the elites, uh, again, uh, sidestepping conveniently the law when it suits them and c- creating a construction, at least in the case of Mekafatari, that the law doesn't apply because this is our team and therefore we're going to create this assumption that she's uh, still a Labour MP despite standing there and telling the whole country that she had resigned from <laughs> Labour, you know, uh, and then saying, well, if she didn't write a letter, she sent an email, but we're not allowed to see the email. And so, you know, the, the Official Information Act doesn't help us because we can't use that on Parliament. We can only use that on ministers. And, and then create a narrative that can't be challenged. And if we do create that narrative um, or start creating a narrative around that, you get called racist. And so all we're seeing or the, the ordinary voters are seeing is, again, again, the elites in parliament uh, riding roughshod over our laws and our rights and everything else when it suits them. And, uh, you know, I agree, too, with the Elizabeth Kerry Kerry situation. What you've got there is the hard left fighting the less hard left in the Green Party for control. And um, you're seeing some green on green fat, fratricide, but I'm not sure we're allowed to use that name because it's sort of assuming. <laughs> Terrible ge- sexist language. Yes, it's not gender neutral gender. at all. Yes, it's, it's misogynist. So, you know, and, and racist as well. And, and, you know, that's... Not acceptable. We're not we're it's racist, hard. sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Any more? Yeah, all the all the 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 poly the, the polyphobes, you know, they they've, they've got one for every occasion. It's There's just... a hangman's noose in there somewhere as well. <laughs> a noose or yeah. a nurse? A noose, a nurse. Oh nurse. <laughs> and, and a conspiracy. Hanging <laughs> from a nurse. Yeah. A, you know the difference between a conspiracy theory and fact these days. Yeah. Six it's weeks. about three weeks. Yeah, yeah, it goes weeks. down every time, right? It goes down every time. All right. Um, are we finished with that one? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I've, 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 I've got a, um, I've got a love you and leave you. It, um, I'm, I'm really sorry to have held you up, but um, no, that's fine. You yeah, can, you can, yeah. you can quit on us. <laughs> <laughs> Splitter, splitter. But we will have you back next time. We will. Okay. Look, that's Lovely been to great. hear from no, you, Mr. Always we'll, we'll, good we'll to hear ca- your voice, Mr. Trotsky. Yeah, and uh, and and likewise, Olivia, put a voice to the to the words. You're very good with words, I have to say. Oh, uh, thank right. you, sir. Okay, Chris, thank okay. you, and we'll just All right. uh, clean up the tail yeah. of this. Thank you so much, and we'll talk next time we do it, which will be next Friday. All right, thank you. Okay, okay then. Okay. Bye bye. So that was Chris Trotter, quitting on us. <laughs> It, it reminds me, Paul, of of the those great sages of uh, British humour um, who knew everything forty years ago in um, Monty Python and the the life of Brian. You know where they talk about Loretta, um, how he wants to change his name to Loretta because he's decided he wants to be a, to be a woman, and and they're all just mocking and derisive of the whole of the whole thing. And then there's the splitters and the. Yeah, it yeah. reminds me of the Green Party. Oh, they're not the right type of Green Party. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then they and People's Front. People's Front it. of Judea. That's and, right. and, then, and then, of course, there was the, 
well, what have the Romans ever done for us? Which, of course, we're seeing a, a reprise of that with what have, what have the British ever done for us with colonialism? You know, it yeah. shows how, how forward thinking uh, Monty Python was back then. Weren't oh, they really sitting in the Colosseum so. saying that? They were in the Colosseum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, yeah. apart from the aqueducts. Well, okay, apart from the aqueducts. <laughs> well, there's, there's, the, there's the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we see. We're seeing a guy in a cowboy hat telling people off for cultural appropriation and abusing colonialism um, while he's flying in planes and, and using laws and sitting in the parliament, which colonialism literally built for him. Yeah. And, and he's criticising it, saying yeah. that, it, that it's been negative. Really? Well, I could just point to the average life expectancy of Maori in 1840 versus now and say that's what colonialism delivers. Certainly to quicker you. taking the plane. <laughs> Than it used to be. <laughs> it's that's, exactly, a, it's, that's a long it's, paddle. It's the same thing as when I don't know if you remember Churchill's takedown of um, Gandhi when um, the Quit India movement were looking very strong, and you know Churchill made those remarks about how dare that savage stride half naked up the vice regal palace. And assert his, um, you know, anti anti British, anti Victoria, anti royal stance, and it disgusted Churchill. But that's I feel that same level of disgust. Exactly what you said, Cam. It's like some savage, you know, that 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 has has actually gotten all the way to the top, sits there and does nothing but you know take a dump on every um, European or what he would see, see, um, uh, you know, the trappings of colonisation, but they want to be in there. And, of course, they take all that money, the EUEs. They're heavily funded, um, millions and millions of dollars, and none of that goes down to um, just average Joe Blow Maoris like you and me, but Maori. And that was really evident again at the protest, which was such a great cultural reference point. And I'm so glad we had it because it's in our culture forever. We'll never lose it. Um, those Maoris that I bumped up with and they babysat my car, they bought me coffee in the morning, they adopted me into their whanau. Um, they felt completely abandoned and betrayed by their own iwis, um, the Maori party most exclusively. And I was really, really um, happy to see Tariana Turia at that time. I don't know if you remember. She came out and called Jacinda a Nazi. <laughs> remember that? I do. Yeah. And um, I remember thinking, and, and the Maoris at the protest, because that happened during the protest, um, they were really, really um, happy that at least somebody that was part of their race um, and their ilk um, saw what was happening, that they were being roughshod over by all this totalitarianism and blatant authoritarianism, um, and Tariana had the guts to call it out, and she used the most extreme language, you know, mm. and, I mean, good for her. It was extreme. Wow. Okay, a couple more things you've put on the list here, Cam. WCC, Wellington City Council, Votes to cut speed limits on all Wellington streets, just what we need. Mind you, people driving slow motion anyway these days, I've, I've noticed. But so down to what? Well, I think they'd rather have um, go back to the days when uh, motor vehicles had to have a runner in front of them with a red flag to warn people. They're, they're that anti-progress um, and against, you know, the internal combustion engine, one of the greatest inventions that man has ever created. Um, these nutters that the people of Wellington keep electing um, just show that, that voters actually get the governance that they deserve. And, um, you know, this is the sort of crazy lunatic type um, behaviour that, that these green-tinged people uh, Luddites even uh, seem to want to take us back to. You know, I mean, the traffic's appalling in, in Wellington at the best of times, um, but slowing it down will just make it worse. It's not going to make people uh, change uh, from a car to a bus. I mean, everyone who's an advocate for public transport 
almost never takes it themselves. They're, they're, they're these kinds of people who believe that public transport is for other people to use. Or well, they and ride in the middle of the road on their bike. <laughs> well, that's right. And then they, they complain notice that. and they get bowled over, you know. With so, their yeah. kids on the back. Yeah. But, but you know yeah. what that reminds me of, Cam, is um, at the end of the Ayn Rand's great magnum opus, Atlas Shrugged, <laughs> right at the end, the train, which is the great symbol of man's achievement, you know, in the internal combustion engine, um, that, you know, inter intercontinental, transcontinental railways and everything, the train is broken on the tracks and the people have to be driven away from it by a horse and cart. <laughs> and that's what they want. That's what they want. I thought yeah, it was that, for safety, you know, for well-being and safety. It's not. They're just trying to drive people out, are they? I thought they had our safety. I don't know. No, not safety. They're Luddites. They're Luddites. They're Luddites. And they're, yep. they're anti-progress, and they want us to all cycle. You know, we, we gave up cycling when we got our driver's license because, you know what, it didn't matter if it was raining. It didn't matter. Um, it, 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 you know, you could carry around three or four of your mates when you went out. Uh, you know, cycling became a pain in the ass. And so we gave that up. But these people are all stuck in their teenage years riding bikes. And then, then they moralise and tut tut and wag their finger at us all and say, we should all be cycling too. Well, I tell you what. On Tuesday, when it was absolutely hosing down in Auckland and everything was flooded, I bet you you wanted a ute on that day and not a cycle. Yeah, totally. All right. Okay, and to finish it off, I don't know uh, how much of a, a huge issue this one is, but the bill to ban seabed mining defeated in Parliament. Ooh. Well, what, what was funny about that was the, the Maori party thinking they had three votes, voting against the bill when they were actually in favour, it was their own bill that they were in favour of, but they voted against it. Then they withdrew their vote. Then they realised that they only had two votes and not three votes, and it was just a complete farce, oh. which kind of explains the whole law anyway. I mean, New Zealand is blessed with these amazing natural resources, and these fools that are out there, the Green Party in particular and the Maori Party, seem to want to you know, have us get our resources from overseas rather than from our own country. It's just insane. I, it's it, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's, it's so, nuts. Yeah. We can't import coal. We can't use our own coal, but we can import dirty Indonesian dirt, coal. Dirty Indonesian coal, yep. And my, uh, no master point. And so these falls are now doing the same for seabed. We're surrounded with huge natural resources, and these clowns, don't want us to use them and want to actually impoverish impoverish ourselves as a nation and beggar us importing stuff and, and making Indonesians and other countries wealthy instead of our own country wealthy. It's so tragic, isn't it? And even, I mean, with the fishing stuff, we've got land in the north up on the beautiful mighty Kaipara and, you know, we could survive there through the fishing, but you just know that they're coming for our fishing rights. You know, the Maoris, the iwi Maoris, not common Maoris, because I do make a huge distinction between them, um, they, they, they're they not going to be happy until we have to, have to ask their permission to, to fish for a fish for dinner. You know, they really want everything. It's good to know that's that there's what, a bolt hole in the north. <laughs> that's what iwi stands for. I want it. I want it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, David Seymour, to be fair, did say that he, he should be, uh, he, he thought we should be mining. He, he did say that. I remember him saying that. We should mine. Well, if we've got mine. it, we should mine it, he said. Exactly. Uh, dig, baby, dig. You know, that we've got these re natural resources that we could be, we're self sufficient in coal. So, in, in totally. Theory, instead of spending billions and billions of dollars paying money to some frogs, um, for to give to the third world, we should be investing those billions of dollars into um, developing clean coal power plants. You know that would be a far more effective uh, solution. We'd be energy um, energy uh, you know efficient. We'd be uh, energy secure, and um, and we'd be cleaner and and do it better than the rest of the world. Probably be cheaper than, as well. Eh? Cheaper. It'd be way cheaper. It can't cost it you know several billion dollars to. Do, to work out a way to scrub the, the the stacks from you know the 
the uh, pollutants that come out from burning it. You know, it's just but, but it's more cynical than that because there are many there are people all over this world who have developed um, um, technology and innovation to be able to draw um, energy to run ho- households. Um, that don't require fossil fuels, but those products are always suppressed or they're bought out and they're never um, they're never developed. I mean, they you know, and it's the big oil and the big um, energy companies that buy out those kind of entrepreneurs that come up with those kind of inventions. I don't think we're going to be allowed to be uh, to move past um, fossil fuels by um, by big energy. They're not going to allow it because because they have to control it. I mean. People call the, the, this line I'm on a bit of a conspiracy, but it's not. Many people have been able to make engines um, and energy that are drawn well away from fossil fuel energy, but they die in their tracks. They never make it to the market, and that is not by accident. Mm. All right. You've reminded me of an old uh, TV uh, local news thing I remember as a kid when some guy claimed he'd invented an engine which he'd put in an old Cortina that ran on water. On ran up on water. Yeah, I bet he did. Yeah, well, I think it went well down the Brooklyn Hill, but he couldn't come back up. It, it couldn't quite. It couldn't quite cut it. But mm. now you you hear these um, inventions coming through all the time, and I mean, people can claim anything, but some of them have been. I mean, Tesla had this idea about drawing ambient energy. Um, you, you know, back a um, hundred years ago, had they run with that at some point, we would be in a very different place. But they don't. They squash them. All right, that's our first political panel. We had Chris earlier, but he quit on us. No, he didn't. That's not fair. He <laughs> yeah, had another engagement, and we won't talk about his ancient phone. <laughs> Send him an <laughs> His dinosaur phone. Can't get service for them anymore. It's probably you lose a component, and it's all <laughs> over. Anyway, I want to thank Cameron Slater, Olivia Pearson, and he's not here at the moment, Chris Trotter. That was a lot of fun, and it was some great information great views, et cetera. I hope you guys will be happy to come back and do it again. Absolutely. Loved it, Paul. And uh, I'll be back next week. All right. Thank Olivia? you, Paul. Thank you very much. Yep. Are you committing to a, a return, Olivia? Um, maybe. <laughs> 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 Typical well, Cam- female. <laughs> Cameron will work on you during the week. Yeah, right. you, you can try. Okay. Have a great cool. weekend, you guys. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you too, Paul. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.